Okay. Hi. Uh, my talk is called What If Infrastructure as Code Never Existed? Um, I'm Adam Jacob. Uh, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on my biography. But once upon a time, I wrote a thing called Chef. That's probably why you remember me. Some of you I remember. Hi. Um, uh, I haven't been in a room like this in, well, I don't know, longer than three years, because before that I had, I, I had quit and fucked off and played Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, Paul Stack, uh, raise your hand, Paul. <laughs> this is Paul. Paul came up with this talk title. Um, uh, they were like, you should talk at, you should give a talk at Config Management Camp. And I was like, yeah, I should, you're right. Um, uh, but then that meant I had to come up with a talk that fit the incredible talk title, right? Because um, it is really like, it's a really great talk title, right? Um, and so to figure out the answer to like, what do you do when someone hands you that incredible talk title, I want to tell you a story. So my first job in technology um, was at an ISP in the back of a dentist's office. So to go to work, my mom would drive me to work, I was 15. She would drive me to work, she would drop me off at the dentist's office, she would walk past people getting like root canals and like cleanings or whatever, and you would go past them into this back room, and there were two telco racks in the back room, and we'd put modems in them, and some servers running BSDI. Who ran BSDI? Anybody remember BSDI? What's up? I fucking love you guys. Okay, uh, guys, try not to say guys. I've been replacing it with all y'all motherfuckers. Um, so, uh, so every time I say that, you're gonna hear me re then say, all y'all motherfuckers. Um, I also swear more the more comfortable I get. So every time you laugh, when I swear, I swear more. Um, so anyway, um, thank you. Um, um, okay, so they would drive me, so my mom would drive me to work, and it was in the back of this dentist's office, right? Um, and uh, and I, my job was tech support, but then I'd been running bulletin boards since I was eight, and so like I knew how everything worked. And so uh, then there was a systems administrator who was like in community college, he was like 21, and he was like covered in black, and he had piercings, and he loved Skinny Puppy. Do you remember Skinny Puppy? Um, and he had a really hot girlfriend, and I thought that was cool. Um, and, uh, and so then I became like the junior systems administrator. Um, and I'm now 45, so that means that I've been working in technology for 30 years, um, which makes me feel old. Um, but it means I saw a lot. I saw Web 1, I saw the internet happen, I saw Web 2, I was definitely like in the dot bomb era. Uh, I built a company called Chef, um, I was there when Velocity started, I was here when DevOps started, um, and, and I just, I saw kind of all of it happen. Um, and so when I was 22, a couple years later, I was working for a different internet company, and I was also recently divorced. Um, so has, who's been divorced? Have you been divorced? Getting divorced sucks. It's better than being married to the wrong person, so do that. Um, <laughs> like, if you need one, get a divorce. It's better. But, um, um, so that was weird, right? Was that weird? Maybe not, because some of you are Dutch, and you're probably like, yeah, get a divorce. Okay, so, um, <laughs> um, uh, but I had also just discovered alcohol. How many people remember discovering alcohol? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and my new girlfriend loved alcohol. And so she was like, you know, she was one of those people that you just, she was like, let's get ripped. And I was like, okay, let's get ripped. So I was at this moment very passed out and really drunk and like happy with my lot in life. Um, but then this thing goes off. How many people carried one of these? <gasps> yes. So the pager goes off like four times, right? Because I definitely didn't wake up the first time. And then eventually the second time, you're like, they'll page someone else, right? And then like the third or the fourth time, you're like, oh, I better enter the pager. So I like roll myself out of bed and I call him back on the landline because cell phones were expensive, right? Um, and, and I call my boss back. And an important note here is that my boss was a retired Marine Corps colonel. Um, not this Marine Corps colonel. Does anybody know who this is? Who is it? John Boyd, that's right. Um, um, right? I really wanted someone to know who it was. It's important that you know, right? It's the OODA loop guy, right? Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and he's in a panic. Um, and so he, I, I call him and he's like, Adam, why didn't you answer my page? And I'm like, well, um, you know. And he's like, the site's down, you gotta come, we gotta fix it right now. And I'm like, no can do, Pikachu, I am super drunk, right? I'm not like a little drunk man, I'm ripped drunk. And he goes like complete 
full drill sergeant. He's like, soldier, you will get out of bed and you will get in the shower and I will be at your house in 10 minutes. We're going to fix the servers. And I'm like, what? I'm drunk. He's like, you're not drunk. Sober up. Bring coffee. And he like, and so he's like, get in the shower. And so I like get in the shower and I'm like, oh, my boss, you know? So he like whips over to my apartment and one of these guys, right, pulls up at like 100 miles an hour, pops out of the car, he's got a cup of coffee and that like Marine Corps pep in his step, you know what I'm talking about? That like, right? Um, and piles me into his car. I barely can walk. It's like world spinning around. I'm drinking the coffee. He's like going 100 miles an hour. It's real dark. And he hauls ass to the data center. So we get to the data center, we grab a crash cart, we plug it into the servers, and he proceeds to just give me a full-on pep talk. He's like, soldier, we're going to fix the servers. We're going to bring the site back up. We're going to make some money, you know? And I'm like, OK, I'm going to do it. He's like, log in. I'm like, logging in, you know? And he just like marches me through it. And then he's like, and figure out what's wrong. And I'm like, I'm so drunk. He's like, you're not drunk. We're not going to die here, you know? And I'm like, OK. And then I fix the servers, you know? And, he's, and, and I make the site come back up, and we start making money again, and he's like, great job, soldier, no one died here. Let's get breakfast. <laughs> and he drives me to breakfast, drives me home, shakes my hand, says I did a good job, and that is pretty much what the last 30 years was like. <laughs> kind of for everyone, yeah? Um, it was just this series of Christatunities, right? Um, first, we had to get everybody on the internet. Remember getting everybody on the internet? Some of you do. I can tell. You're old. Um, everybody else is like, no, right? Because um, they were already on the internet. And then we had to put content on the internet because all these people showed up and they didn't want to just, like, whatever, read my GeoCities page. And so then we had to build applications on the internet. Because it was like, hey, remember? remember when it was cool? We could put a map on the internet. Remember that? That was cool. And then uh, we had social media. We were like, what if all our friends were on the internet, right? And then we could show them pictures of food. And then we did. And then digital transformation. Suddenly, all the companies on the planet were like, what if we were social media companies? And then that'd be cool. We could just run like Facebook and Google. And we were like, great, we'll do that for you now. And so we've just been doing that over and over and over again for 30 years. And essentially, each one of those bullet points had some version of that Marine Corps colonel you're right behind us being like, figure it out. Please, God, fuck. Figure it out, right? It was a very creative time. Um, <laughs> um, not just for me, but I think for everybody. Um, problem after problem, solution after solution, like musicians, kind of swept up in a cultural movement. I think we just made it all up as we went along. And when we started, there weren't any rules that made sense. Um, I remember picking up the few books that you could find on systems administration early in my career, and they were just loaded with lies. You know, they were like, you know what a good idea is? To plug a printer in to your server and print out syslog. That way you have a hard copy in case you get hacked. <laughs> How many of you did that? I did for like a minute, and I was like, no! Okay, we came in, we were so fucking proud, and we came in that morning, and it was just like the room was full of paper, and we are like, oh no, what have we done? And, and it wasn't just those, like every single thing we did, rule after rule after rule, we basically just made them up. And now, though, we're 30 years in to sort of making up those rules, and I gotta tell you, y'all basically accept most of them as if they were laws of nature. You just do. You're like, well, of course we do it that way. It's the only possible way it could have worked. Um, and I assure you, they are not. At best, they're like guiding principles, maybe creative criteria, like, like the box in which you could create. Um, this is Rick Rubin, um, and Rick Rubin had this to say about rules. He said, rules direct us to average behaviors. If we're aiming to create works that are exceptional, most rules don't apply. Average is nothing to aspire to. And that is why Paul Stack wrote an incredible talk title. Because it's an invitation to break the rules. It's an invitation to explore and to create. And, and as a movement, we're kind of stuck in a rut. We're a little playing our own greatest hits. That's one of the reasons I left Chef, is I found myself in a room, and I was basically explaining the same thing I'd been explaining for a decade. And it was going to work, and they were happy. But I was like, oh. <laughs> like, there's no juice. No, no, no. You know, no dopamine for that moment. It was just, it was just, I was playing myself on TV. Um, and I think as, in, as, a, as a movement, um, we're basically just doing small variations on the theme for the same essential outcomes. No, not really that much better. Not really that much worse. Just a little different. Average. It's kind of fucking boring. And we desperately need to start breaking some rules again. Um, 
And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to just spend the rest of our time together breaking some rules. You want to break some rules? Yeah. Yeah, let's break some rules. I got a list of rules right here. Um, and what we're going to do is you're going to shout out to me which rule you'd like me to break. And then I'm going to break it. Um, and, then, uh, and then when we get to the end of that rule, we'll come back to this slide and we'll do it again. Yeah? And we're not going to be able to break all the rules, I expect, um, before time expires. Um, but, you know, a couple. So I know that you're European and you don't like to talk, although that guy, what's up, shout out to my homie, who was willing to like get it done. So uh, let's go, let's pick. Uh, which rule would you like me to break? Oh, did you say configuration is code? That was amazing. I'm so, that was very thoughtful of you. Um, so here's the thing. I, I, we have to break this one first, because if we don't, I think it's nearly impossible to imagine breaking the others, right? All the other rules just don't even fucking make sense, um, because everything we do sort of stems from this one historical decision. So let's talk about where that rule comes from. This is SendMail CF. This is the original configuration syntax for SendMail. I, I can hear by the grumbles that I'm not alone uh, in having written a SendMail CF file. The first SendMail CF file was written 41 years ago. So depending on who you are, you want a nap. Um, um, raise your hand if you wrote one by hand. Send mail CF. God, I love this fucking room. You're just so much my people. Um, see, I told you I'd get comfortable and swear more. Just, ah, how do I not love all y'all motherfuckers? Okay, so, it was a nightmare, is the TLDR. If you didn't write one by hand, you don't need to know. This is the most straightforward syntax I could find. I didn't show you rewriting rules, which were basically line noise. There were huge books written on it. It was awful. It was terrifying. So 31 years ago, they switched to this. This is a SendMail MC file. Um, they used M4, which is a macro preprocessing language, to basically just generate that SendMail CF file on your behalf. This was 31 years ago. So for me, uh, there were some distributions that had SendMail MC, but most didn't. So when I first started running ISPs, we wrote CF files by hand. Still, we had a couple of years to go before the SendMail MC thing really landed for everybody. But suddenly, things were so much easier. They were so much more dynamic. And for me, this was the first time I remember writing code for configuration. The idea that what I was going to do was write code. I was going to write a program which generated the configuration file, which then was the thing that I wanted to run. I'm sure that somebody did it before, but this is the first time I can remember doing it. Has anybody ever, ever used Helm? Helm is sendmail.mc for your YAML. Yeah? And you chuckle, but you know it's true. Okay, so look, this is a snippet of Terraform. There's a direct line from sendmail.mc to Terraform, right? Like, what is it we're doing? Well, it's really complicated to write all the AWS API calls that do all the things that make that EC2 instance happen in the world. So what do we do? We wrote a little language, a little macro preprocessor, if you will, and it took in our context, and then it did some stuff and moved on. We changed the syntax, we gained some power, we changed the domain, but essentially, everything we've done this whole time works roughly this way, right? Some human being writes some code, they ship it to an interpreter, interpreter reads it in, does some junk, then does some stuff to the world, right? It either in the case of Terraform, it like does some stuff to AWS, right? Same with Pulumi, same with CDK. The, I'm doing a lot of hand waving on the stuff in the middle, yeah? But, but roughly, that's what they're doing. Um, and they all kind of store some intermediate state somehow, right? Because we read the code in, we do some stuff, then we remember what we did so we can come back to it later, yeah? Um, so what's good about that? Well, it's flexible. It's certainly maybe less verbose, you know, if you think about the delta between writing it all by hand versus writing it in some kind of, 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 of code, it's probably better. Sometimes we can refactor it, sometimes we can't, right? Um, I don't know if you ever tried to refactor your Terraform. Anybody tried to refactor some Terraform? Yeah, did you like it? No. That's a no, in case, in case people were wondering. They didn't enjoy it, it wasn't fun. I didn't like it either. That's not a drag on Terraform. I didn't like refactoring Puppet either, that's why I wrote Chef. Sorry, but I'm done. Um, shots fired! Okay. Um, um, <laughs> Okay, so look, it, also good about this, it can abstract whatever it is you're doing, right? If you know what to do, you can write a little interpreter that makes it say, do it now, right? And then do it. Um, what sucks about it is it's static. You write it, and then it's written, and it sits there, and there's not a whole lot you can do with it except 
run it. <laughs> um, it's unidirectional. So if you remember, all the arrows went in one way. You wrote code, went to the interpreter, interpreter went to the world, world did things. But it just moves, that's the flow, right? You write code, pass it to the thing, thing does stuff, done. Um, it's also abstract, which is a good thing and a bad thing. So when what we're doing is modeling configuration, you know, SendMail MC was great until it didn't, you didn't have a macro for the thing you needed to do. And then you were like, oh no, now I gotta go write a macro that does the complicated thing I was trying to avoid. Um, and you actually needed to know more about how the system works, not less, because now I need to know two systems, the macro layer and the underlying one. Um, no behavior. So when we write code, the code is kind of the behavior, but I can't ask it to do things. I can't go to my code and be like, hey code, change yourself. You know, not really. Kind of, I can go to an IDE, I can like hit the refactoring button or whatever, but mostly I can't attach behavior to it. And it doesn't really understand relationships. The only relationships code understands are code relationships. It understands I call like this function called another one, or, or maybe this file has a relationship to another file, but, but that's, that's pretty much what you got. Um, so what would be better than code? What about infrastructure as model? So what if instead of thinking about it as code, what if instead we said that they were actors? And I mean actors kind of in the Erlang Elixir style, right? So we basically, like a running process that sits in the world, has its own state, remembers who it is, takes methods for mutation, right? So we can, we can pass messages to it, and then it, and it changes. Um, we can also attach behaviors to those actors. So we can both say, hey, can actor, configure yourself, right? Or set this property or do this thing. We could also say, start yourself or stop yourself, right? Or uh, whatever you wanted to do, right? Update your list of tags, right? We can put whatever we want against those behaviors. We can also have relationships because we can express them between actors. We can say this actor requires another actor, right? Or we can ask an actor to pass a message to another actor whenever their properties change, right? Actors. Um, so that would change the world like this. So now a person could interact with a representation of, of something, right? So this could be code, that could be a user interface, could be whatever you want it to be. But what they're really doing is making a call to some persistent runtime somewhere. And what that runtime does is synchronize your inputs to the model over a message, right? So we say, hey model, configure yourself this way, not that way, right? And then the model could be persistent, right? It's essentially in memory, right? Um, and if you, you're gonna quibble with me because you're gonna be like, well, it can't always be in memory, Adam. And you're right, like we persist them to databases or whatever, but it's a thing we know how to do. Um, and the model can be aware of their relationships. So we can think about things like saying, you know, this AWS instance that we wanna run is also an instance of CoreOS, and those could be two different actors that are modeled differently, right? Um, and then the model could be responsible for synchronizing itself with the world. So instead of saying that there's an interpreter that does it, the model could be responsible for managing its own behavior. So how would the world be better if we did it this way? So one, we could have lots of different representations for that configuration. So instead of saying we write code only, now code could be one of many possible representations, and we could build those representations any way we wanted to from the model. Um, they're aware of the relationships. So much of what we do is actually describe the relationships between things, right? When I described that there's an EC2 instance running CoreOS, all of you knew what I meant. And those are relationships. They're two separate things, but we know how they relate. We know that I have a server that runs an operating system, which then gets configured. Um, we can encapsulate runtime behavior in a way that you really can't right now in the code. So if you think about, I wrote some code, I wrote my Terraform declaration, my Pulumi declaration, it does what it does. I can't really like, ask it to do something other than what I declared. I can't reuse that information. Now you can, because it's a running API. I could query it if I wanted to. Um, no more state management. Who loves state management? Raise your hand. Not a single hand, that guy. One guy, two guys, two people. All right, all y'all motherfuckers. No, you don't. <laughs> You're full of lies. Um, um, you also get bi-directional data flow, right? So instead of having data only flow from, from one part of the system to another, because the actor handles all the transitions, I can drive that actor from anywhere, right? So if I wanna drive it from the real world, I can. And ultimately, it's easier to model because what we're modeling is the world, right? So instead of saying we're modeling the abstraction, so we're not saying in order for this programming language to function, what we're gonna do is map a domain to the programming language, we can say, nope, we're just gonna roll up the behavior of the real world and model that. Um, and that actually is significantly easier to model because you don't have to think about the abstractions. Okay, let's break more rules, yeah? What do you want me to break? 
Source, Source control. Okay. Are you just going to go in order? It'd be crazy. <laughs> I wrote this delightfully nonlinear talk, and everybody's going to be like, well, I was thinking we could read the grid. Talk to anyway. Uh, it's, it's unfair because I railroaded you. Okay. RCS was the first version control system I used. That was 41 years ago, was when RCS was created. RCS, who used RCS? Again, because you're my people, like half the room. Um, SCCS, what's up? Okay. Um, um, look, you mostly checked out individual files. It was like a mutex. Uh, over an individual file. Um, CVS was the networked version of RCS, um, and it also would let you commit multiple files in a single commit. That was kind of amazing. Um, and so the rule was we used RCS for server config and CVS for application code, and all was good. Um, if you're not old, you probably mostly have just used Git. Maybe someone made you use Subversion at some point in your life, um, and you were like, why don't we just use this? It seems easier. I don't know. Um, we went, because, I don't know, Linux. So. Um, in many ways, the way we do it now is kind of a step backward uh, in terms of user experience, I think. Um, but it is distributed, except we centralized it again. Anyway, enough. You don't need to hear it. But, um, but basically, source control has remained in this unbroken line. Kind of works like this. We write some code. We check it in somewhere. That gets pushed to a repository. Then somebody else comes along. They check the repository out. They do some stuff with it. It's kind of the TLDR, source control. What's good about source control? I can save copies, I can revert things, I have a history, um, I can get a diff. So because what we're source controlling is text, um, I, can, I can show you what changed between the text. Uh, I can share my work with other people. Sometimes I can work in parallel, that's pretty cool. Um, you can have pretty complicated capabilities for managing conflict. So everybody who's ever done a rebase or any of those sorts of operations, like that's a pretty complex operation and it was, it was harder in the olden days, just so we're clear. So like it is pretty great to have, have newer tools. But there's some things that suck about source control too. First one is it's only good for text. So if you got something that's not text, well, good luck. Um, there's no context about the impact of what a change has done. There's only the delta of text. So because what we're doing is storing text, we can't really say, if you change this line of text, the following things will happen. Or you changed it for these reasons. We just kind of overload all of that context into the commit message. Um, it's pretty difficult to put policy in source code. Who's done GitOps? Been rocking your GitOps? And you put some policy in the repo, but like it's not the best, right? And like it's pretty, it's not very granular. You can't really, it's pretty hard to be like, well, only you on this. So then we like split the repositories up. So we start using repositories and the creation of them as a splitter for policy. Kind of sucks. Uh, it's a real pain to automate. Shout out again to my GitOps friends. God bless and keep you each and everyone for going through that. And also, ugh, right? <laughs> Can we just have a moment? That's awful. Okay, so. Um, and rebasing, who loves a rebase? No one does, but I'm glad that we have to do it. So what could be better than source control? So what if we had model aware change sets? So if you take my configuration as code example where the world was the model, now we could say that the model needs to understand the idea that it could have more than one possible hypothetical configuration, right? So we could have one model that is the current model of what I expect to see in the real world, because in the real world, things tend to only exist one to one. You know, all the chairs that are in here are similar chairs, but each chair is a unique and individual chair. Um, and so the model could be aware of a change, just like you know it was in CVS, where we're like, hey, there's a change set, and then every model we could hypothetically apply some change to their configuration, and then we could embed policy at the model level instead of at the source level. Yeah, so we could say hey, Paul Stack is allowed to change this model, but not that model. Or he's allowed to set this value, but not that value. Or call this runtime behavior, but not that one, right? Because we've moved it out of source control and into, the, in, into some place that's both within our control and also that makes sense sort of logically in your brain. We could also automatically rebase the model. So when the world changes, what we're saying is, hey, when I take a change set and merge it, what we're really doing is just saying, the state we wanted the world to be in has altered. And so every open change set could then reflect the delta between what you said you wanted in that hypothetical reality and the delta to actual reality. So it could work more like this. So if a person comes in, they create a change set, and then they ask the world, they say, hey, Docker image, uh, you should be configured this way. So I have a Docker image, its name is Whiskers. It's got a relationship to a core OS config that wants to run that container, which then is going to run on an AWS instance. And then it's also going to run in a Kubernetes deployment, which I think I put on twice now that I'm looking at this slide with fresh non-airplane eyes. And, um, and one thing you can see is that when you change one part of the model, it might cascade 
into other parts, right? Because it's aware of the context. So because we can map the relationships, we can actually tell you, hey, this one small change in the Docker image cascades to these other places. That's pretty opaque in your source code, right? In your source code, you're like, if I reuse that variable, there's no way to tell that that one line you changed actually had this cascading impact. And suddenly we can see that that impact actually happened sort of all over across the whole system. Um, and then when we have lots of these change sets open, it becomes a question of perspective. So instead of thinking about the world and change sets as a thing that happens in text, we can think about them as an overlay to the world. So there's the actual reality we want, and then each change set is a hypothetical reality we're asking the system to create on our behalf. So the benefits of doing it this way, easy to collaborate. We can give you contextual diffs. Right? I can tell you not just you change this, I can say this is what will happen because you propose this thing. <laughs> Automatic rebasing, policy is easier to add, and it's really lightweight compared to creating a branch. More rules for the rule gods. Testing. You can't be the guy. He works for me, he can't say testing, and we're going in order. So what do you testing? want? <laughs> <laughs> testing. Okay, testing it is. I'm fucking soaked about testing. Let's talk about testing. This is Joseph Juren. He wrote Juren's Quality Handbook in 1951. Um, he was obsessed with quality both generally and specifically. Um, and he did it across a bunch of uh, different stakeholders. So it wasn't just about software testing, it was about quality in general. So a lot of management theory, a um, lot of ideas about sort of how you put that stuff in the world. If you haven't read some of it, you should. Um, it's pretty good. And he defines quality in two ways. So one was quality means that the features of a product that actually do what it's supposed to do. So does it meet the customer need? The second one is, is it free from deficiencies? Which I think is a pretty solid definition of quality. This is a unit test for Pulumi. It's using Jest, um, and it's pretty typical of testing infrastructure as code. I, I, I'm gonna pick on it for just a hot second, but it's not, I'm not picking on Pulumi. Like, it doesn't look a whole lot better if you write test kitchen, HashiCorp Sentinel or whatever. But essentially what you're doing here, one thing to notice is it's pretty obsessed with how Pulumi works more than what it is we're trying to test. So the top part of it is basically saying, hey, wait for Pulumi to run. When I get these variables that have been exported, then apply those variables to the function underneath it. And then I can write the code that says, hey, do I have a tag that's name is name, yeah? Um, so what's good about this is it can catch regressions, right? If you built some infrastructure and it didn't have a name tag, this will stop it. Um, it can be flexible across different layers and it can enforce some of that policy that we lost uh, in source control uh, again. What sucks about it? Well, the feedback loops are real slow, right? Um, so when you run the tests, it takes a while. The more of them you have, the better you feel, but the longer it takes. Um, how many people here love mocks and stubs? Again, there's like one motherfucker in the back. What's up? Love the mock and stub? Yeah, but I mean, most of us don't. Um, um, and really, the big thing here is that they're not super well fit for purpose. So testing code, in many ways, makes a ton of sense. But what we're all here for is configuration management camp. We're infrastructure people. What we're testing is this reflection of the real world, and we're hoping that the real world then does what we say it will do. But it's not quite right. There's, a, there's an impedance mismatch between the tools we think about with testing and the, for source code and what we're trying to test in reality. So what could be better? Well. What if we built tests into the model? So rather than thinking about them uh, separately, what we do is attach testing to lifecycle events in the model. So our little model could say, hey, you know, one thing that happens is someone sets a property. And when people set a property, I want to validate that that property is true or false. And so we could just attach a function to that event. So the model, we could tell the model, hey, model, whenever this property changes, run this function, right? And then it would run the function and it returns true or false and maybe a little description that's like, hey, you gotta put the name tag on the thing, right? We could also qualify the whole model. So instead of just thinking about it as a single field, we could say, hey, every time any field changes, then let's look at the object as a whole and make sure that it makes sense. Because sometimes a, every field individually makes sense, but in combination, they don't. Um, or we maybe are more concerned with the real world. So we're like, hey, uh, every time that the real world changes its state, which happens outside our control all the time, let's run the model again and confirm that what we expect is what's there uh, and then make recommendations, right? Um, and then we could make those things reactive to their inputs. So rather than running them when you run tests, instead you could run them like all the time as we're making changes in real time. Um, so here's an example. This is a simplified qualification from system initiative. 
So this checks that a Docker image actually exists in a registry. So when you, whenever you actually decide you want to use a Docker image, this little snippet of code runs every time the image you want to run changes, and it just runs Scopio and says, is there an image here or not, right? So if you fat finger the Docker image name, you don't have to wait till you run it to learn that you were wrong. It just tells you immediately, yo, I can't see this thing, maybe something's wrong. So one thing to notice is how much simpler this is, right? So it just sort of gets you straight to the point. If it wasn't for that little exec command there, right, it's pretty obsessed only with what it needs to be obsessed with. That's because the model takes care of all of that scaffolding around the edges. So all of that part that's like obsessed with how the program works, we've removed because we can just put it into, into the actor because it's fit for purpose. So the upside of thinking this way, we get immediate feedback. They trigger only when we need it to. Um, they're easier to write because the harness is kind of defined and you never need to mock or stub anything um, because we can make a distinction between when are we working in hypothetical reality and when are we working in real reality reality. More rules. Declarative? I heard declarative. What's up? All right, let's do declarative. This is Mark Burgess. Mark Burgess is the most handsome man in configuration management. <laughs> um, I would also like us to just give a round of applause to Mark Burgess because we're still just living on Mark Burgess's good. I love Mark so much. Um, he's such a good person, um, and he's done so much for all of us. Um, but uh, the first time I heard somebody say that uh, configuration should be declarative was Mark 25 years ago, um, and that was CF Engine 2. Um, Kubernetes, I think, is the current poster child for, for being declarative, right? Um, we, we like write our YAML, we hand it to the interpreter, the interpreter chunks over it, right? Um, but, uh, and it reconciles. I'm just gonna bring this diagram back up till you're sick of it in your back teeth. This is Kubernetes too, right? So what's the interpreter in the middle? It's the Kubernetes, right? So I wrote my YAML, I threw it at my Kubernetes, and my Kubernetes did the thing, and then it synchronizes with the outside world and it controls state. State goes in at CD, yeah, but it's like, and then on and on we go, right? Um, what's different is how much or how often we reconcile, but the gist basically is the same. So what's good about declaring what we want? Well you know, you can just say what you want. <laughs> so that's pretty good, right? Like instead of saying how to get it and how to, all the pieces that need to go into building it, you can just say, give me a chair, you know? And then chairs appear. Um, it can be a lot less verbose because the steps to build a chair are long. Anybody ever built a chair from like Ikea? And you're like, why are there so many steps to building a chair, right? Um, so, so that's cool. Um, it's a little easier to deal with failure um, um, because the failure can happen in the interpreter. So the interpreter can sort of figure out, you know, it, how many people just like, when your puppet run didn't work before there was module ordering, you just ran it again and we're like, it's probably cool, right? Um, yeah, everybody did, because that's why I wrote Jeff. Okay, so um, I don't know why this has turned into that. I swear to God it wasn't when I rehearsed it, but, but it's something about being in this room is really bringing back old rivalries in a way that's freaking me out. Um, and I didn't see coming, and I'm kind of sorry about it, but also it's fun, I don't know. Um, Okay, but it can be catered to the domain. Um, you know, it can be really focused on the vocabulary, the specifics of, of what we're doing. What sucks about it is generally there's only one state at a time. So if you think about your, the things you're declaring, you can really only declare that it is in one thing. So like, you know, I can say that I want this package installed, but I can't really say I want this package installed, then do something else, then uninstall it, right? Unless you were using Chef, and then you could. But, um, um, but generally you need to know there's a problem I call the 200% knowledge problem. So this is the problem with community modules. Um, every community modules project has devolved into this same pit, which is, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to rewrite Apache 2 configuration 100 times? And so we go and we try to build the perfect abstraction from whatever the language is for Apache 2 so that nobody has to write it again. Only that now the problem is you need 200% of the knowledge. I need all the knowledge about Apache 2 to know exactly what it is I want to say, plus I need to understand all the weird shit you did to make the abstraction work so that it was simpler to use, easier to use, right? This is the 200% knowledge problem. It's not better, it's worse, right? It's better to just do the thing you need. Um, they're hard to extend. Typically you extend declarative systems in a language other than the language you declared them, right? So you gotta swap languages, you're creating modules, you're creating extensions, the, the conceptual mapping gets pretty brutal pretty fast. They suck at modeling workflow. 
um, because they are declarative. So moving through multiple declarative states is kind of a problem. The other is they kind of take a while to run because they sort of take as long as they take. Um, like however that loop is, it just sort of has to do what it has to do. Um, okay, what's better? Infrastructure is model, unshockingly. So if instead what we do is we think about this declarative world as a digital twin, and we say what I actually want to have is a digital version of the universe, that's the hypothetical one. And then the model, and then the real world is a resource that I'm related to and I'm twinning them together. So think of it like a heart-lung machine, right? When we want to model heart-lung machines, we don't do it on a heart-lung machine with a patient, right? We have a software model of the heart-lung machine that tells us patient lives, patient dies. If there's, and they'll tell you what the values are and it'll be like, okay, make sure they don't die. Um, uh, it can be one-to-one -to, -one to the domain. In fact, it must be one-to-one -to, -one to the domain because otherwise we get back to the 200% knowledge problem, right? So. Whatever it is that you're modeling, your model needs to be a reflection of that thing. So you don't have to do that mapping in your brain. Um, the, our ability to like set properties and behavior goes up because now we can describe more about the domain itself. Instead of just saying, here's the, the declaration and that obviously implies intent, right? We can instead say, nope, like just tell me what the, thing, the knobs are and then tell me what the behavior is you'd like to see. So, it changes the world to kind of look like this. So imagine you have like a person who decides they want to uh, change a model. So they could set a property um, uh, on their model and they can do that to their heart's content because it's not hurting anything in the real world. And then they could decide they want to call a behavior. They could say, create that model in the real world. At which point a resource gets instantiated, which has its own properties, which maybe are probably a one-to-one -one set of the other model's properties. Maybe they have some extra things that can't be changed, some of the read-only, right? But, <clears throat> but that ability to create the behavior now means that if those values change from the outside world, we could change the properties in the model. So we could go back the other way and we could say, hey, someone logged into the AWS console and they changed a property, and now that property flows back into our model because the actor could take it, right? It doesn't have to patch your source code and commit it to Git. Um, so properties can sync both ways. So the other good thing about this is that behavior becomes really easy to collaborate, to put together into a workflow. So all of those multi-step processes you do, where you're like, hey, I wrote some code, I checked it into Git, I ran it, then I waited, then I wrote this change in Git, <laughs> then I committed it, then I waited, right? All those things can become really easy to express because now it's just call this behavior, wait till it's done, then call these. So expressing them in workflows becomes really straightforward. So the benefit here is we gain more control, we gain a little, we gain lots more power, we eliminate the 200% problem because the model is the model, its job is to model the world directly. We get to reuse configuration in behaviors. So all of that configuration that can help us make decisions about what to do is still available to us because we can query the, the, the model to do it. Um, we can pick and choose which behavior to run. So sometimes the right thing to do might be change the world to match the model. But sometimes the right thing to do might be to change the model to match the world, right? And we can pick and choose. Um, also, it's faster. It's faster to write, it's faster to execute, because it only requires really knowledge about the domain. How am I doing for time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. I might have time for one more and then I gotta, then I gotta end. Single source of truth. Single source of truth. Okay. <clears throat> First time I heard the word single source of truth, was Novell Identity Manager. And if people remember Novell Identity Manager, it was a meta directory. Um, uh, I'd love to tell a funny story about Bobo T. Clown and the security guys freaking out, but call me later. Um, I'm around, I'll tell you a story. But um, the way you think about this is code. You likely believe that the source of truth for your infrastructure is the code that defines it. Uh, your KTML, your Terraform, your Pulumi, your, your, your whatevers. Here's the diagram, you've seen it so many times. See why we had to break the rules? Okay. So what's good about it? Uh, it does uh, make it easy to change things because I have a single source of truth, so I know where to go. I just go to that thing and change it. Um, it's easy to reason about it. Data kind of flows only in one pattern. What sucks about it <clears throat> is conflict resolution. So if, if things go wrong or there are multiple things that need to change from multiple sources, which one's right, which one's wrong, you know you say that there's a single source of truth, but eh, you know, um, you can't resolve issues at the source. But fundamentally the problem is it's a fucking lie. Yeah? It's just a lie because the truth is not your source code, especially if you're doing infrastructure as code. It's clearly the infrastructure. Like, like obviously it's the infrastructure, right? 
Does anybody disagree with me? Don't disagree with me. We don't have enough time. But if you do, come find me and I'll be like, what are you talking about? It's clearly the infrastructure, right? So the real problem with this is really straightforward. It's just a fucking lie. So how do we make it less of a lie? <laughs> Digital twins, oh my god, Adam's got a thing. Okay, so look, we take this theoretical model that lives in our heads, the thing that you put in code right now, but instead we say that theoretical model is in fact theoretical. It, it exists hypothetically only in our brains. And then the real world is the real world. They're both true depending on the context. So in a world where what I'm doing is saying, I would like to see a world like this, my hypothetical model is the reality that I want to live in. In the real world, there's only one real world, and that's the one that's running. And in that world, it may or may not be what I desire. But that's true for the real world, and we should separate them. So it works more like this. When you're dealing in hypotheticals, the model's the truth. When you're dealing in the world, the resource is the truth. So you can update either side. Functions can compare the two. So we can say, hey, write a function that when something changes, will then compare the hypothetical with the reality, and then make a remediation proposal, right? It could say, hey, these things don't match this way. But we can go the other way too. We can say the world doesn't match the model. My proposed remediation is change your model to match the world. Um, benefits, it doesn't lie. There's a clear demarcation between when are, when, when are we doing something in our heads and want to know if what we propose in our heads would work in the world and is there something working in the world. Um, it's bi-directional. Um, so it can move from the world to our model, it can move from the model to the world. Try doing that in your source code, you can't. Um, how about state? It's gone, right? All of that like state management stuff that we've, that we've decided we have to do somewhere, pretty much you can just eliminate um, because it lives in the model differently. Um, it becomes really safe to change the real world directly. So if the way you know how to fix something is to log into the AWS console and click a button, log into the AWS console, click a button. And then the only bad thing that's gonna happen to you is that the real world will change, we'll track it, we, we'll show you what happened, and then we'll be like, yo, do you wanna update your model to match the thing? And you'll be like, yes, because that fixed production. And then you move along. But you don't have to worry about whether something else is gonna come along and like overwrite your vision of the universe because we've broken the link between saying that the source code is true and reality is false because it was always what? A lie. a lie! Yes, that wasn't loud enough. Try again. A lie. a lie! Yeah, stop lying. Okay. Okay, I have to wrap it up. If you haven't guessed yet, these are all rules that system initiative breaks, roughly in the way that I have described them. This is the first time I've ever talked about system initiative in public. Um, it, you, you've been able to find me, but this is, you're literally the first humans who've ever heard it, and it's such a fucking relief to talk about it. Um, um, it's also gonna be open source, and that's the first time we've said that in public. So we're gonna open source it. We're not gonna open source some of it, we're gonna open source all of it. Um, nice. <laughs> um, and we would love to have some of y'all give it a whirl before we actually make it public to the entire world. So. Uh, if you want to see what it looks like, do you want to see what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. So here's an example of composing a model with relationships. So each of those components in the diagram is an actor, like I described. So they're a literal process that's running somewhere. Uh, and what you're doing when you're creating those relationships between them is you're configuring them. So you're actually saying like, hey, this Docker image informs both the, the butane configuration that's gonna run on CoreOS, but it also informs the ingress rule that opens the firewall because the Docker image exposes a port and we want that port to be exposed. And so that configuration, we don't have to write by hand, it's inferred through the relationships. Um, the source code that you see over there is generated um, by, and it's fully dynamic, so it basically takes all of those property inputs and then generates the output. So the, all that like podman goo that's in the user data there to launch the container, that all got written automatically um, by a function that was attached uh, to that particular thing that says, hey, when we, do, when we write uh, that butane configuration and we expose it, that configuration then gets packed into user data. Um, this is a fuller composition view, so zooming out a little bit, um, you can see change sets kind of in the upper left over there. So that's that. what we're doing right now is proposing a, a, a model of the world. Um, 
and you can see that we have a, a failing qualification. So basically the, that EC2 instance has got a little warning knob there, and what it's telling us is that the EC2 configuration isn't quite right because the key pair that we need doesn't exist yet. Um, and so it's a, war it's a warning, not an error, because there is a key pair attached to it, and our assumption is that we're gonna create the key pair when the time comes, and therefore it's probably right. Um, but since you can pick and choose when you apply different things to reality, it might also be wrong. Um, stuff that I'm not showing you here, um, there's a little tab up there with the little beaker guy, and if you click it, it pops up an editor, and what you can do is edit all of the code that runs the system. So all of those models are expressed as code, and you can just write JavaScript functions till you fall over. Um, okay, well that's what system initiative looks like, and if you want to try it, you can in a couple of weeks go to the website and sign up for it. Um, um, Paul Stack and I uh, have a lot of stickers. Um, we're never gonna make those stickers again. So if you want them, there's a cute cat, it's got wings, same as whiskers. Um, uh, and you can have them, we'll be around to chat more um, about what's happening, but, uh, but I wanna leave you with this because I, I didn't want to turn it into a product pitch. Um, look, everyone who's in this room uh, and why it was important to me to come to this room is because this is where this is where the people who are actually the best at this in the world tend to gather. Um, and your knowledge of the way we do it and of the rules as we understand them is invaluable knowledge. Um, it, you learned those rules and we came up with them because that was real hard fought truth. But it's also a bit of a curse. Um, you know, as code, as an idea, isn't really pushing us forward anymore. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's kind of holding us back. Um, and I hope that you're inspired to create something new, something unorthodox, something beautiful. Um, and I can't wait to explore what's possible when we all decide to break the rules together again. Because it was so fun when we broke them the last time. So thank you. See you later.